thank you very much, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, some good networking. Certainly, we have a wonderful array of exhibitors out there as well. And uh, I hope uh, if you had, didn't have a chance to go out in some of the showcase of electric and alternative fuel cars that we have as well, uh, we have quite a lineup out there with Tesla and a, a Volt and a Leaf and a few others. Um, uh, so, yeah, hopefully you can take advantage of, of those also. Um, our next, uh, and also uh, I realized uh, we did not have a chance at the very top, and this is my own uh, uh, omission, but we didn't uh, thank our sponsors. So I want to make sure that we thank uh, Commerce Centers, who is our gold sponsor for the symposium today, as well as thank you very much, Commerce Centers. as well as the uh, Cocoa Beach uh, uh, Courtyard by Marriott, who's our um, uh, hospitality sponsor. They're uh, helping with our reception, as well as uh, with um, uh, many of our folks are staying there. So thank you very much to the Courtyard. <laughs> and to Space Florida. Uh, so thank you very much, Space Florida, as well, for your support. And uh, we have our next panel to kind of kick off our afternoon session, um, which is all about, you know, we are the Space Coast, aerospace capabilities and how they apply to, you know, clean energy solutions. And uh, for that, we have uh, Todd Halverson, who's the um, KSC Branch Chief for Florida Today, uh, to moderate the panel and a wonderful array of panelists who you'll hear from shortly. So thank you very much. Here's Todd, and thanks very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today, and um, what you see here on this panel is a group of uh, guys who really have some interesting stories to tell you about um, how they are taking aerospace technology and expertise uh, that has been developed uh, over the years in the space program and turning it into solutions for clean energy, and hopefully solutions that will bring new manufacturing onto the Space Coast and new high-paying jobs that will help replace some of those that have been lost as a result of the shutdown of the shuttle program. Um, our panel, uh, starting here with uh, Mike Galusi. Uh, Mike is a supply chain manager with uh, NASA. And um, he has an interesting story to tell about how to squeeze all the efficiency you can out of the supply chain to uh, uh, basically bring new manufacturing into this area and help us replace some of those uh, lost jobs. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Bill Notard. Bill, let me like, not no slaughter your Notard. No tard Donato. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry for yeah, took me a while. slamming your name around. Uh, and then we have Jim Fletcher, who's the CEO of CPI Technologies. And we have Ravi, Rav, Ravi Shankar. Ravi, Ravi Shankar. And uh, Ravi is with uh, Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne. And um, they have... Uh, a way to convert natural gas into hydrogen. And that could be used in a number of different ways to drive clean energy uh, solutions. And we also have Jason Williams, uh, who's a senior engineer with um, Siemens, and he has a good story to tell also. I think the way we're going to do this today is I'm going to let these guys basically uh, give you about a five-minute briefing on each of their stories because they can tell it a lot better than I can. And uh, I'm going to give them this little tool so that they can click through their, uh, their presentations. And we'll uh, start here with Mike, who has a real interesting story to tell us. Mike, go ahead. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you very here. much. If I can, let me, does this go right into this? OK. What I want to do is start from a 10,000 foot level and kind of build a crescendo into, uh, I guess, an announcement for you, Todd, maybe, uh, into, into the group the effort that we're working here uh, from NASA uh, overall, agency wide. Back when uh, President Bush was, was in office and even to, to date to this current administration, there's national space policy, presidential 
directive to strengthen leadership in U.S. related uh, space-related sciences and technology, but primarily focused on industrial-based viability. This direction is really focused on not only the the production capacity, capabilities, but new technology or new emerging technologies that are needed for future human spaceflight. Um, this is a key risk lately, and I'll go into the details to this. Um, what this policy translates to NASA is a, a requirement where it is now a requirement onto the deputy administrator by name, Lori Garver, and also down to her into the associate administrator, Chris Scalise, and in an effort to address this policy, there was a creation of the Industrial Base Interagency Working Group, or we kind of affectionately call it IBIWIG. And it is IBIWIG uh, that I'm representing today, so representing at NASA headquarters for the most part. And IBIWIG, I might say, is chaired by the headquarters chief um, engineer's office and also the chief technologist office. I'm going to see if I can see the reflection back here. Okay, so why focus on the supply chain resiliency? We know for a fact now, after a conclusion of an extensive uh, Department of Commerce survey and study of this human space flight, um, space industrial base, that the industrial base is at risk. It's a serious threat to um, the changes that we see in not only the econo economic situation, the changes in government policy from redux reduced budget to changes in programs, case in point, with shuttle termination and constellation uh, getting into the next human spaceflight program creates a significant risk in terms of a time gap between procurements. Um, the market capitalization for NASA is decreasing. And to give you just a general overview of our preliminary findings of this Department of Commerce report, which, by the way, will be delivered to the White House here fairly soon, and eventually to, to Congress, we're finding that a third of our human spaceflight suppliers are very dependent on NASA business. Um, a quarter of them, quite frankly, don't want to continue on with NASA, and half of them have no interest in commercial spaceflight. Why this is concerning to us is because we know that as diminishing market growth has a direct relationship to um, not only to reliability or quality, but new technology innovations. It's the lower tier suppliers, not so much as the primes, I'll do respect to Pratt Whitney and to Lockheed and Boeing, it's the lower tiers, it's the what we call the missing middle. A majority of our new technology innovations are sourced from this level. Roughly, I've heard estimates between 70 to 80 percent, really can't put our figure, finger on it. But basically, this is our concern, and this is, these are technologies that are needed not only for human spaceflight, but also for new emerging technologies such as green energy sources and, and, and technologies. Um, this, and I'll be blunt, I mean, this is a, a national security threat. So what we're trying to do is understand uh, means to really stimulate the, the, the base, if you will, ensure supplier viability. Um, why? Because we also know that there's a, again, I kind of mentioned, there's a direct relationship and correlation between a supplier's um, 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 liquidity, if you will, and product quality. Uh, and that also induces or in, in invokes potential risk for counterfeit parts. We have a significant risk and threat within the United States with the injection of counterfeits. You see it on the news, typically Gucci bags and, and, and um, movies, if you will but it has penetrated into our pharmaceutical supply chain as well as our aerospace and defense market. I'll give you a most recent example. We, the Russians launched the Martian uh, probe. I can't remember the name offhand. Uh, it was proven that was actually a failure because of counterfeit parts. Um, I don't want to get too much on this jaggle. I hope I've got five minutes, right? Two more minutes left. Uh, so this inter global interdependency does create risk. There's a multifunctional relationship in understanding how various programs and changes in programs and policies impact the supply chain. So what I want to do, a little bit of a, I'm going to go through all of this. This is kind of the agency, if you will, strategy in terms of ensuring a viable industrial base. I mentioned the survey that we did. So the best way to read this is from left to right, more tactical to strategic. Uh, we kind of wanted to navigate our way through the fog, so this is kind of our navigation tools. We wanted to do the survey, understand really what's going on with the lower tier suppliers. More importantly, what is happening with their research and development investments, capital expenditures, workforce, um, 
their overall financial posture and, and so on. Um, it is concerning because we're also observing that R&D monies are drying up. And, and these, these dollars are going into simple things like paying the bills. So it's really economics 101. It's about um, uh, you know, current ratio, debt, debt profit margins, debt equity ratios, things like that. And I can tell you, on average, the industrial base for the first human space flight is below what we would want to see or what considerable market industry trends would expect. On all the way to the right, um, these are all projects we've, we've pursued and are in the process of going after. On a far right block there, we did complete a study with the uh, Army through OS, Office of Secretary of Defense, in terms of understanding and proving interoperability between agencies and, and systems. Uh, we actually built the Robonaut uh, hand the digits. We want something fairly robust in terms of technology. And we also built the M2 machine gun barrel extension. We actually did this at the depot here at Cape Canaveral. And we also did this work at Rock Island and Picatinny Arsenal. Um, this actually evolved into, and here's my announcement, I guess, the um, National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium, or we kindly affectionately call it endemic. Hopefully it'll become a pandemic. This is essentially to promote advanced modeling, simulation, 3D CAD integration, information technology uh, uh, transfers all the way up and down the vertical chain. And uh, we have had a very successful uh, step one um, up in the Midwest. Now, mind you, this endemic program is a part of the White House Council on Competitiveness. And within endemic, we were focused on the um, Midwest initially. Uh, we work with Glenn Research Center and a number of universities up there. My announcement is that we are expanding this, or I shouldn't say the endemic project as a whole, is moving to the southeast. Uh, and that southeast will consist of um, Huntsville, Louisiana, and Florida, and also Mississippi. Uh, primarily from a NASA perspective, it'll include uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, Mashu, and of course Kennedy Space Center, but from a KSC perspective, primarily the IT, Computational Sciences Division or group, and other on the commercial side, uh, we're working very extensively with FIT, uh, PTC, which is a very robust um, uh, PLM software provider. And um, to name a few, Picatinny Arsenal has committed to this just as recently as yesterday in uh, DARPA. And also we're having discussions with, um, with Office of Secretary of Defense again. And also uh, for how this relates to this symposium, uh, there is a very strong possibility that Department of Energy specifically the smart grid may actually come into this environment or into this project um, or in this program I should say of the program there is a project we're trying to establish and that's what we're calling a virtual design and manufacturing cluster I've heard clusters mentioned here before what this is is it's it's an attempt to try to aggregate demand drive in to not only product commonality but process commonality this is critical in terms of obtaining affordability and more importantly, um, reducing costs or SGNA. We talk acronyms quite a bit at NASA, but we don't talk about PNL. It's really about profitability and the suppliers. So we feel very strongly that if we can develop a cluster in which that you, the suppliers have the ability to leverage shared resources in terms of facilities, tooling, potential um, funding through private equity firms, and not so much on state and federal liens. This is an uh, attempt to allow the private industry and free market really dictate and, and, and drive toward a self-sustaining business model. And through, yes, through Endemic, although it is a public-private partnership, it's where I think private would kind of take the lead. And yes, there is some federal funding tag with this through EDA, but that's really just enough to light the pilot light. It's the uh, commitments of various contracts from people like, for example, Picatinny, commercial entities, and, and so on, that would actually help this become sustaining. Uh, I might also add FIT, again, is very instrumental and in, in one of the lead, lead, lead players in this, and uh, we hope to have this kicked off very, very soon. Very good, so Mike. Um, thanks very thanks. much. Um, I should mention that we're going to try to leave time at the end of this for uh, a little Q&A. So if you have any questions as we go along, just uh, write them down and We'll try to get to them at the end of the uh, panel. And uh, Bill, it's your show. Okay. 
So I'm here to talk today about a project we're doing out at the Kennedy Space Center. It's called the Ground Ops Demonstration Unit for Liquid Hydrogen. And uh, it's a test that uh, we're, we're going to be doing over the next three years. And the background on it is, you know, KSC has been dealing with liquid hydrogen for a long time. We put these systems in for the Apollo program back in the 60s. And back in the 60s, that was the state of the art in large scale cryogenic systems. Uh, we haven't really modified them too much since then. And really, since then, cryogenic industries bypassed us by probably two generations on everything from refrigerators to insulation. Well, not necessarily insulation, but in some cases, vacuum jacketed lines, uh, components, actuators, things like that. So, we want to uh, develop a small scale system. And it's not really that small scale, it's 33,000 gallons of storage. So it is of the scale of a, an upper stage, like a Centaur stage. Uh, not quite as large as what you would need for the SLS, but we'd like to prove it in this intermediate stage before uh, if, if it turns out that it's worthwhile, then we could eventually incorporate it out in the spaceport. So uh, really our operations, the way we do operations out there is totally unique from the way any other industrial gas uh, company they're a company that gets industrial gas supplied to them. Use it. We, we use it in very large bulk quantities uh, all at once, and then we might not need any more for three or four months till we launch again, and then we need another very large bulk quantity, whereas most people are using it continuously a little bit every day. So that makes our, our operations challenging, and because of that, and because we have outdated equipment as well, uh, we're losing about half of the hydrogen that we purchase. So imagine going to the gas station and as you put the gas uh, nozzle into your car, you know, 50% of the gas is dripping onto the ground and evaporating. You know, it gets expensive. So we want to prove that we can recover a lot of these losses and, and launch a lot more of the hydrogen that we purchase. So that's the main focus of this project. In addition, we're going to be testing a couple of advanced technologies in terms of uh, in situ liquefaction and propellant densification. So the GoDo LH2 system, uh, the goal of it is to demonstrate the advanced LH2 service and capability. We have three primary objectives. We want to do something called zero loss storage and transfer. Uh, some people may have heard of zero boil off. This is uh, even an extension on zero boil off. We want to be able to recover any losses that come in from our tankers from New Orleans. Uh, you know, we buy our hydrogen in New Orleans, and by the time it comes here, we have to vent it down before we put it in our tanks, and we lose about 10% of the hydrogen just from that. So we'd like to be able to recover those losses. Uh, also, the chill down of the cross-country lines, we'd like to be able to route those vapors that get generated in that chill down back to the tank to recover. Uh, we want to demonstrate the propellant densification technology. Uh, a couple of the launch service providers are looking at propellant densification. What that means, everybody has seen the external tank on the shuttle, and it's obviously very large, and most of that volume is made up of liquid hydrogen because it's not very dense. But if you take the hydrogen and reduce the temperature so that uh, it's below its normal boiling point, uh, the normal boiling point is about 20.3 Kelvin for hydrogen. If you bring it down to about 15 Kelvin, somewhat close to its triple point, you can get an 8, eight to 10 percent increase in density, which corresponds to, in some cases, up to 15 percent payload mass fraction increase because of all the uh, secondary effects as well. So, but there's a lot of handling difficulties associated with densified hydrogen because it's below its normal boiling point. It, uh, it is subatmospheric unless you pressurize it with an external source. And if you have subatmospheric hydrogen, you have to be concerned about uh, the air and specifically oxygen leaking into the tank. That would create a hazardous situation. And there's also pressurization issues associated with densified hydrogen. So we want to do some densified hydrogen production and uh, servicing operations. And then finally, really the goal for, for me, the long-term vision, is I think we need a, a propellant production facility out here at KSC. And I could point to you know, a study that was done back in the 60s and another study that was done back in the 70s and some other SBIRs that were done in the 90s that say that you know, if we had a production plant out here, it would be economical and instead of buying it from New Orleans. So uh, we're looking at being able to have a different type of liquefaction technology where we have a centralized production plant out here at, at somewhere either on KC or Cape Canaveral Air Force Station with pipelines that go to all the different pads that need it. And then the liquefaction happens right there at the pad. 
uh, inside the tank, and the tank is a zero loss tank, and so we're hoping to get 80 to 90 percent of the hydrogen produced being launched. Uh, right now, I don't think we're going to be able to recover the hydrogen that is being lost during launch countdown because the, uh, the insulation on the flight tanks is not optimized and the heat leak is just too high, so we wouldn't be able to recover that high of a rate. But uh, all the rest of the processing losses we'd like to be able to recover. In addition to that, we have a number of secondary test objectives. Uh, I mentioned that we're kind of far behind in, in modern component technology, valves, actuators, things like that. We want to prove some of these technologies, bring in some modern components and uh, operate them and show that they are reliable and possibly even do qualification testing on them. Uh, we're looking, we use a lot of helium out there right now, and most of the helium is being used for the liquid hydrogen. Uh, purging out the lines or pressurizing, things like that. We're looking at conserving helium by doing uh, possibly sweep purges with gaseous hydrogen to warm the system up and then purging with nitrogen. And then when we need to chill the system back down again, we, we sweep out the gaseous nitrogen with gaseous hydrogen and then put the liquid in. And that could save a lot of money in, in helium cost. Helium is a non-renewable resource and, uh, and we, we just can't afford to keep throwing it away. And then uh, finally, there, you know, when we're done with the testing, we will have some type of small-scale economical, in, in my opinion, liquid hydrogen test capability where we have a test cryostat where we will be able to test components, instrumentation, or other uh, systems that people want to test in liquid. So here's a little bit of a description of the system. Uh, we have a 33,000-gallon liquid hydrogen storage tank. It is being, well, the heat leaks in, and there's also energy that comes in through the gas inlet, either through liquefaction or pres pressurization. Any heat that leaks in gets removed by the refrigerator and gets dumped to the atmosphere. So that the, uh, what we're shooting for right now, we think the heat leak on the tank is about 300 watts, and we're hoping to get, well, we're, we're, we're going to get at least 500 watts of cooling at 20K, uh, but we're hoping for as much as eight or 900 watts of cooling at 20K. Uh, we have 240 feet of vacuum jacketed transfer lines that's going to be going up to an actual Centaur test article. It's a flight weight tank that we will be using for our propellant densification and loading demonstrations. The flight weight tank really makes a big difference in terms of thermal performance. Uh, you know, some similar tests have been done before on smaller scales, but always with like ASME type vessels, very thick walled tanks. And this just gives us a much more realistic operation. For new procurements, we're going to be getting a 500 watt, at least 500 watt refrigerator at 20K. Uh, we're getting a vapor shielded transfer line. We're calling it a high efficiency transfer line that we will be able to maintain the liquid stored in the line at all times because there's a vapor shield at 70K that will intercept most of the heat. And then that vapor shield that intercepts the heat gets routed back into the tank to get reliquified. And then we have over here this hydrogen test cryostat, which will be a reconfigurable uh, test apparatus that as customers want to come in and test things, we can pop off the top flange, reconfigure it, put it back on and, and do testing. So uh, really the main reason why I'm here though is I wanted to spread some potential opportunities for partnerships. Uh, this system really does have a tremendous capability. Uh, it's not just with the liquid hydrogen the cryogenic refrigeration system will be unique in Brevard. There's nothing like that. Uh, right now, there is a somewhat similar system up in the National High Field Magnetic Lab up in Tallahassee. Um, they have a couple of cryocoolers up there, but theirs are optimized more for liquid helium temperatures down around 4 degrees Kelvin. So this is a, a 20K refrigerator. Um, when we're done with this, uh, you know, there, there's potential spaceflight customers or engine test stand customers. I mentioned propellant densification. Once we prove that we can do the operations for loading a vehicle with densified propellants, uh, the next real technology challenge is to make sure that engines can operate using the densified propellants. So a potential is to take this system, and it's being built and designed so that the refrigerator and the tank can be moved. I wouldn't exactly call it portable, but it is somewhat movable. Uh, you know, it will take a, a, a bit of effort, but we could potentially either take it down to West Palm Beach or over to Stennis and do some densified engine tests. Uh, I mentioned that the test cryostat, we could do some LH2 component qualification testing or other testing in there. 
Uh, we are looking at partnering with some people to do hydrogen energy testing like uh, on automobiles and possibly fleet vehicle demonstrations. And then finally, uh, I mentioned that the cryo cooler is a unique opportunity for uh, doing low temperature energy research, primarily in superconductivity. Um, if, you know, if people wanted to test large prototypes of syst superconducting systems that they need to uh, have cooled down to 20K, we would have that capability. So in conclusion, I mean, I, I'm from the cryogenic test laboratory, and it isn't necessarily immediately obvious what cryogenics and energy has to do with each other, but cryogenics is a very energy-intensive process. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, we, we're losing about 50% of the hydrogen we buy. If we recovered all that hydrogen in a typical year, uh, out, uh, a typical shuttle launch processing year, that's the equivalent, uh, we save so much energy, it's the equivalent of removing 3,000 cars from the road and the amount of greenhouse gases that they produce. Um, there, there is tremendous energy savings potential. And, uh, and, and in addition to the possibility of using hydrogen as an energy carrier, there's a lot of other energy possibilities associated with this system. So that's all I had, and I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Jim uh, Fletcher of CPI Technologies. Okay, thank you. I don't know where to point it at. There we go. Uh, well, I was here, uh, I guess it was this time last year for this panel. I was uh, actually an employee of United Space Alliance. So the story I guess I'm really focusing on today is kind of the, the whole, one of the reasons we're here from a, at least the Space Coast Energy Consortium. What they're trying to do is help startup companies like my new company. Uh, last year working for USA, now have a little startup company called CPI Technologies, and I'll tell you the origins of that in just a second. But uh, there's one big difference between last year and this year. This year I don't get a paycheck. Last year I got one. Huh? So. Uh, I'm learning what it, what the real life is like out there, trying to trying to make it. Uh, but let me tell you, there's a for those of you who are in my same shoes, I, I see several faces in the room that I know. <clears throat> there's a lot of help uh, in the consortium, the Space Coast Energy Consortium, TRDA, and uh, Florida Solar Energy Center. Everybody's been, everyone has been very gracious in uh, trying to hold my hand through the process and. Uh, uh, I know I'll probably leave out some folks, but there's the, the, the whole idea of this partnering, if you will, with the uh, consortium people, as well as uh, the mentors that have been in place down at TRDA, people like that. This, uh, it's a good experience, and I'm really thankful that they're there. Uh, with that said, uh, what I was talking to you about last time was primarily had to do with uh, uh, had, had to do with the fact that we had this workforce out at Kennedy Space Center that would be available to start trying to develop uh, products and uh, and services for this area to try to keep people employed in Brevard County. And the, one of the projects I was working on at the time um, was a spinoff of a, a development proce a project that had started, independent research and development project that had started within United Space Alliance back in 2002. <laughs> I don't have a photo of it up here, but there's, if you go to my booth out on the southwest corner of the, uh, in our room there, uh, you'll see some legacy hardware there. It was an access platform, a deployable truss access platform that was kind of the beginnings of this. Uh, USA had partnered or co-developed along with uh, Merrifield Engineering uh, of Nashville, Tennessee. Don, Don Merrifield might raise your hand there. Some people might want to talk to you. He's the, actually the patent holder of the truss technology that we're trying to develop. And uh, my company's been formed to try to do further product development along some of the product lines and uh, lines of business that we see potentially out of the multiple configurations of the trust, of this trust family. And the uh, first project that we actually uh, conceived as a product potentially here is uh, a byproduct really of a little prototype that we built at Kennedy Space Center about two years ago. We started it. April of last year, we did a little uh, mechanical demonstration of the project. It's a portable solar generator and what you're seeing here is just a, a, a graphic, a 3D model graphic of a deployed array and there's actually two of these of what you see here that were built and it has about a uh, 14 to 1 uh, compaction ratio. So you're seeing the compacted view in the front right lower corner and it's about 21 feet long I'm sorry, 21 on each wing, so it's 45 feet long across the thing, and it compacts back into about a, uh, it's a, 
I think it's six feet across the across the dimensions, but that includes the the box in the middle and everything. Anyway, it's roughly ten to one. I'm sorry, fourteen to one. The uh, just another couple of views. You can see up in the middle of the panel. You can see what it looks like in a pre-deployed uh, position. Uh, but if you go by, I'm actually going. Hopefully, this uh, video will run. Uh, Todd, maybe you can help me down in the. If you can get to the uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner, there should be a little video. If you could start that for me. You'll just kind of see the action of it. And, uh, of course, there's four of these wings that, that go out like that, one on each side of the uh, elect uh, electronics box is, is sitting in the center. And, uh, again, it's based on uh, uh, we'll, we'll have that running at our booth if anybody wants to come by and see that in more detail, but just wanted to give you a feel for what it's like. Uh, getting it stopped now might be hard, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we can get back to the... There we go. All right. The uh, the truss is the. I'm sorry. I got ahead. I think I got ahead of myself. Can I back up on this thing? Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Anyway, this is a single wide array, and it was built with uh, uh, panels that were only 175 watts each. And when you combine the two together, it was about a 4.7 kilowatt uh, array. And we had married it with the electro electronic components and put it on a skid with the wheels and with the jacks so that you could actually lift, put it on the back of a flatbed trailer and take it somewhere to use for emergency management. So the idea was it would generate power at Kennedy Space Center until it was needed for hurricane relief or something like that. And that the idea was to demonstrate. Actually, it was a little bit of a spinoff. The idea was a little bit of a spinoff of the work that's being done here in some portable generator work at Florida Solar Energy Center. But the idea was to show the compaction capability of a deployable truss that we were looking at. There was a spinoff of a, a platform in the orbital processing facility for shuttle, uh, but in always with a vision of possibly even doing something on orbit someday with this deployable truss. And there are some applications there that we'll eventually like to pursue, but there's, there's quite a few Earth uh, applications as well. The, uh, so since, since April, when we got laid off, we've been, uh, been working with Merrifield Engineering about the technology to try to develop it within my company and his together to, to try to market some products. And one of the products we're looking at now is actually a double-wide version of what you saw, trying to get the cost down uh, you know, per, per watt. And so we have a, a – this is one bay of, a, uh, uh, of this new truss, a double-wide truss. And you can see it's uh, – what is it, Don, what's the number on the bay length? I forgot all of a sudden. It's About seven it. feet. I'm sorry, seven? Seven feet. Seven feet, and it falls back into a two-inch space, as you see on the right-hand side. And it's a 21 and a, half to, uh, 21 and a half to one compaction ratio, compared to 14 on the previous. And uh, this is an example of where we could go. We're not there yet, but we're, this, uh, we're in the process of building three bays uh, that would be one-third of the length of this. This is a 65-foot array, 11 feet wide, and uh, would be 11 and a half kilowatts using the sun power 320. But we could put any solar panel on it, uh, most any, I'm sure, that we can make it fit with just some slight adjustments in the lengths of the truss and the widths and stuff. But uh, it deploys nicely. Uh, what we think we have an opportunity here to possibly develop a... Uh, possibly a new way to install solar farms and other microgrid applications where you can use the portability of the truss to to actually do some of the manufacture excuse me do some of the installation work the labor that normally happens in the field to bring it back into the factory and to hopefully do it uh, more efficiently to do it maybe cheaper uh, certainly to end up with a product that's been uh, quality inspected and tested uh, prior to being delivered to the field and uh, do a lot of things in parallel that, not, uh, that are currently today uh, happening serially on the most solar farm developments. So we think there's, a, and again, this was a little bit of an afterthought, I have to admit. We were, we were focused primarily on the portable generator, the DOD uh, rapid deployment markets is where we were, we were going to head with this. But it, we, we started beginning to get the vision that we might be able to compete in this arena uh, because of the potential savings of uh, doing a lot of this work in the factory. And, of course, that's still TBD. We're in the process where we are right now is getting cost estimates from some local shops with our drawings that we've just completed. And we hope to be uh, putting together some uh, cost analysis and comparisons and uh, to see what, how, bad, how far we are off the targets that we'll need in the future to be able to meet to compete in that arena. And that's just a, 
another view of the same truss but tilted and it would be just on uh, hopefully some standard uh, mounts in the field but using the, the uh, truss capabilities to carry the load over large, larger distances and to be able to still within the wind loads and stuff we think the possibility is there to uh, reduce some of those costs as far as the field installation as well as far as the number of posts and things but what this array would represent is one module in a field I think this is a 11 half kW uh, module and it's one of 676 modules that would make up this 7.8 megawatt field I'm showing in this illustration and uh, we're, we're even proposing that there might be a, uh, an option to designate some of these modules as emergency management modules that would be dual purpose they would they would feed the grid you know 300 and some odd days a year and uh, when a hurricane were to hit Florida, they could be moved to that site to provide electricity in fairly large quantities uh, for the sites affected. So that's, uh, I think that may be my last one. Let me just check here. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, we were just formed as a corporation in December. And uh, uh, like I said, we have our drawings. We're going to start getting some cost quotes and starting to form some partnerships and things like that with people talking about. We actually, t actually turned down a couple of offers early on from people that wanted to, to do some things in the military markets, primarily because I was unsure of myself as a, and in the negotiating scheme of talking to people about uh, uh, long-term agreements and exclusive relationships and stuff like that for the, for the uh, intellectual property. But uh, we're encouraged by the interest that's been shown in this. And again, I want to reiterate, I'm very thankful for the help from uh, the, the consortium and the different folks that have been involved in, in helping us. So uh, thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to entertain questions at the end. Robbie from, uh, Robbie from uh, Pratt & Whitney. He's got a great story. Good afternoon. Um, thank you uh, to again to Space Coast Energy Consortium for the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about Pratt Mini Rocketdyne and how an aerospace propulsion company came to energy as part of their business portfolio. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, there are a few slides that we normally do as our uh, uh, presentation. I might go through them fairly rapidly because I would like to address some of the attributes that, uh, that lend themselves to us being in energy, uh, some of the aerospace attributes that uh, actually make us, uh, give us the opportunity to play in the energy field uh, along compete with the people that are long established. Um, <clears throat> now we have a long history of the launches, uh, including the space shuttle main engine. Uh, and about 50 years in energy as well. Uh, one element of our early days was energy, although it was a separate part of the company. And later on, aerospace became, <coughs> propulsion became the primary business. And uh, during our first uh, energy crisis back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, we got back uh, into developing some of the energy programs. And, but uh, once again, when the energy crisis passed, a lot of the impetus for those development kind of died at the time, and uh, then the space shuttle program took off, and with that, a lot of our resources got diverted back. Um, but around the mid-90s and uh, late 90s and then into 2000 and on, uh, energy has been a significant part of our uh, focus, mainly because we saw the the one, an opportunity, uh, both from a carbon capture uh, point of view to reduce the carbon footprint and uh, also higher efficiencies, which we felt that some of our aerospace experience can come to play. And these are currently our major technologies. We have a, an exhibit uh, in the main hall and uh, all of these are displayed there and uh, I would uh, definitely ask that you stop by, take a look at it, and feel free to ask us if you have any uh, questions. I've also left a bunch of my cards and uh, some brochures there for you to take. Um, this is some of the energy products that uh, the markets that they address, and we do consider those things. I think earlier this morning, um, the director of ARPA-E, Dr. Martin, was talking about being aware of the market, and we are. And, 
With that, let me kind of leave it here for now, and then I will uh, address the, the major attributes that we bring to the energy uh, sphere. Some of these are technical. Um, one, the two most obvious ones are our expertise with combustion. I mean, that was the core uh, to a lot of our propulsion. And uh, the experience with rotating machinery. You know, we built some of the pumps and turbines that go into these rocket engines. So we have experience in both of those operating in the extremes. The combustion expertise, uh, especially the dealing with high temperatures and high heat flux, played into our development of the gasifier. This operates at a higher temperature than any other gasifier that's on the market today. And, uh, and it is significantly more compact as a result of that. And some of these uh, attributes also give it the higher efficiency and a performance that, uh, that's a step change over what's currently out there. Combustion technology experience also plays into our hydrogen generator development, especially a key component of that, which is the burner we use, short residence time burner we use for uh, calcining our sorbent. And it also is an important element, core element, of our downhole steam generator, which is a oil field uh, enhanced recovery tool that uh, we are developing for the oil industry. Rotating machinery experience is where what we are putting to effect in our uh, development of the supercritical CO2 turbine. And you might see one of our exhibits is on that. It uh, talks about the higher efficiency, significantly higher efficiencies, by using a supercritical CO2 turbine cycle, thermodynamic cycle. Along with these, there are certain expertise that we have brought, analysis and design, in the high performance, high efficiency, extreme environments. Um, and then the experience of working as teams to solve complex technical challenges. And this goes back, all of it comes from the propulsion heritage. Um, lastly, materials. There's virtually no exotic um, material that we have not used or have looked at in, as part of our propulsion uh, technology and several manufacturing areas of manufacturing towards making components. Those are the technical areas we bring to that and they affect a whole bunch of the development of these technologies. They, we've definitely benefited from that. Just as important are a couple of organizational attributes. One is uh, the experience and the bent for technology development, the processes that are involved using some kind of passport or gated process in the development of technology, uh, being able to actually pitch the technology to people that are willing to support it. And I would not undersell that, especially for people who are starting out uh, with new and innovative technologies and are looking for support. The last, uh, second attribute is the uh, experience again in the interest in public-private partnerships. Throughout the propulsion program, that's what we've done, a public-private partnership. And that's also been important in our dealings here in trying to develop a demo opportunity in uh, Florida on the Space Coast. And that's pretty much what um, an aerospace propulsion company brings to the energy uh, place. You know, the technologies are there, but they're all derived from various attributes we bring to this uh, sphere. With that, I'd like to uh, conclude my discussion and just offer a thanks uh, to Space Florida for actually getting us, making us aware of the potential here on the Space Coast for energy uh, type of uh, projects and uh, uh, to uh, individuals uh, who've been with Space Florida, and uh, this is what enabled us to be here, aware of it, and I wouldn't be here today without it, and we are seriously looking at the potential to demonstrate one or two of our technologies in this area. Uh, thanks very much, Robbie. Um, Jason uh, Williams, senior engineer with uh, Siemens Energy, is uh, here, and 
he has a fascinating story that uh, you, you just have to hear. Jason? Here we go. Um, my name's Jason Williams. I'm with uh, Siemens in, I'm sorry, I'm with uh, Siemens Energy, um, mainly the gas turbine division um, and the uh, materials branch. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is actually some little reverse from what Ravi was just talking about. We're an energy company that's utilizing aerospace, or, or at least the residual aerospace that's now currently at Kennedy Space Center. And um, uh, primarily we're utilizing, currently we're utilizing uh, the, many of the non-destructive technology techniques that are uh, still at Kennedy Space Center. To, uh, to inspect some of our gas turbine blades that we currently have, um, I'm sorry, there we go, that we currently have in the field. Um, right now we're bringing those, we used to bring those blades into one of our facilities in uh, Houston, Texas and do the inspection there and we found that it was more cost effective to, to perform these outsourced. So uh, we, we started looking for a location where we could, uh, that would have the technical expertise uh, where we could utilize and uh, and keep it centralized and close to home. Currently, our fast warehouse, which is uh, is our facility that houses most of our our gas turbine blades, is located in Orlando, Florida. Uh, that warehouse distributes most of our uh, our blades that are our new blades that are coming right off the factory floor. Um, the other location where a lot of these blades come from are from the customers. And when a customer like FPL and their system goes down for their for their for their normal maintenance, they'll they'll basically at times they'll remove these blades and they'll send them in for inspection. And uh, the those blades will end up at Kennedy Space Center at Hangar N on uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Hangar N has been the uh, the, the point where um, non-destructive evaluation has gone on for years on the space shuttle and, uh, and at, at Hangar N they basically receive our, our parts in, they, uh, they arrive at the space center and then they perform what we call a three-tier inspection on this. All right, and the three-tier inspection begins with a basic visual cursory inspection which is done with a 30x microscope handheld microscope that they actually utilize to capture images up and down the blade surface looking for indications either in the new blade from manufacturing or possibly service induced defects that could occur in the field for any particular reason. They also perform a, a new form of uh, inspection which is called acoustic thermography which is actually one of this is actually one of Siemens technology. We, uh, we actually have loaned one of our acoustic thermography inspection systems to uh, USA so that they can perform this uh, this inspection. It's a form of uh, infrared thermography that basically utilizes a, uh, a, a Branson ultrasonic welder which is nothing more than a horn to induce a vibration throughout the part and that vibration in theory when you have some indications such as uh, a close tolerance indication like a like a crack for instance it, those uh, those areas would actually rub together and high-speed infrared cameras will actually pick up those those indications and they'll flare out. So excellent inspection technology for, for blades and veins and, and a number of other applications as well because we're currently applying it to a number of FAA applications currently as well. Um, but from here, the inspection then goes into the, the digital radiography. All right? And currently, United Space Alliance has a state-of-the-art 11-axis robot digital radiography cell. Uh, that particular cell is, uh, is, was originally designed to inspect the aft skirt of the, of the space shuttle uh, for the SRBs. And uh, now we're utilizing it, as you can see right here, our blades are actually set up with the robotic x-ray, the ro x-ray system here and the digital panel here. It captures the images and those images, of course, come real time in so that they can see the images, they can inspect them for us, you know, and give us the, the results. These three inspections combined give us an extremely high detection capability. So once the, the parts are completed, they basically box them back up. The data is sent via FTP site to us in Orlando. Uh, they ship directly out of uh, 
United Space Alliance's location at Hangar Inn, and they go back to the fast warehouse or straight back to the customer. And uh, then we do the review. Uh, basically, we've been performing these inspections there, and our turnaround rate uh, for a set of 66 blades has been within three days, which is almost double what we were utilizing at our facility in Houston and uh, not to mention a savings of about 30 percent so you know like a lot of people might have told you in the past that you know uh, space center is expensive to do business with that's not true <laughs> i want to get that out and clear uh the only issues that uh, i would like to definitely address you know with i know we talked with nasa at the beginning of this is that uh, a lot of the the problems that we did run in initially were problems of uh, you know setting the terms and conditions up, getting a lot of that stuff set up and in place, that took a majority of our time. And if maybe, you know, some things could be done to smooth that process out, that would, that would definitely benefit any industry out there that wants to do business here at the Space Center. Also, we are currently um, under negotiation with Quinetic to do a, uh, uh, a working for others contract with them as well. And through Kinetic, we will be able to utilize many of the other applications at Kennedy Space Center and many of the other contractors, including NASA. So, um, and through that, we can utilize practically any of the labs uh, at the Space Center that are, that are currently uh, in operation, either they be NASA or contractor. And um, that's basically, oops, sorry, I did have one more slide, but that's quite all right. All right, that's it. All right. Thank Thanks you. very much, Jason. That's uh, fascinating. I think we have time for a couple of uh, questions. Um, who's got a question? Oh, come on, folks. You got one? So you're hiring NASA to physically do the inspections, or are you just using the facility? We're currently hiring United Space Alliance. To, to do the inspection. We're utilizing their facility as well as, uh, as uh, their people. So, uh, okay, so you still have to handle liability issues if they, you know, they, they uh, stepped well, on a blade and they got through or something. Well, what, what, the way that we handle that is uh, because this is non-destructive evaluation, all NDT processes are, uh, are certified through ASNT, American Society of Non-Destructive Testing. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, all of the individuals, the inspectors, are certified at least level two with a level three on site. Those are the levels of, of inspection uh, criteria that we've got. We, all, we also uh, have set up and uh, also go out and certify, hands-on certify each one of the inspectors ourselves. And we have quality oversight. Uh, they're basically performing and they're not Let's make sure we got this clear. They're not actually accepting and rejecting parts. They're basically reporting what they find based on the criteria that we give them. Uh, we still hold the, the final say-so on what happens to the parts. So. One more? Yes, yes. In the future, uh, through the Working for Others contract that we're trying to set up right now with Quinetic and the Engineering Services contract guys, uh, we're looking at uh, utilizations of the materials science labs, uh, vibration analysis, a number of other labs that are out there at the Space Center that are definitely of benefit to us, you know, on the materials side. I think that's about all the time we have today for uh, questions. I wanted to thank our uh, presenters for, for being here, Mike and, and Bill and Jim and Robbie and Jason. Uh, give them a hand, folks. Well, Robbie has one thing you want to say. For everybody else, but I would be available in case there are any questions. My colleague will also be here tomorrow, uh, so uh, throughout the exhibit tomorrow. So we'll be available. I'm sure the other panelists would also be there for questions. Thank you. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure there will be a, quite a number. And thank you again very, very much. And thank you to Todd for a great panel.